Thank you very, very much. Thank you all for staying. <coughs> and Tim and Judy John, thank you very, very much for doing so much work to organize this. And I thank you all for being here. Hope you enjoyed my talk, which is called <coughs> The Time for Action is at Hand. And yes, that is Cinderella, about whom I'll say just a little bit. Um, I guess I'm very much in favor of having hotlines. <coughs> I, I'm, I'm easy, I easily get lost. <coughs> I'm also interested in planning, so here's the plan. Um, and you can read that for yourself. I'll need to read it to you. I'll keep going through these things and then at the end I'll say bye. Um, <coughs> uh, I guess one or two of you said a little bit about yourself, so I'll say just a little bit about myself to set the context for this. <coughs> um, so I went to graduate school at Stanford in the 1970s and <coughs> in cognitive psychology. And one of the leading textbooks at the time was this book, Human Memory by Roberta Klatsky, <coughs> who ironically has gone on to study action and happiness, among other things. But at the time, she aptly reflected the state of the field and I'm not gonna belabor the point because I would merely be repeating what has already been said very eloquently by others here today, which was that <coughs> um, this is how the human memory system might be conceptualized, how pretty much it was, echoing actually Ulrich Neisser's uh, manifesto, Cognitive Psychology, published in 1967, <coughs> in which the function of the memory system is to take information in and maybe store some of it away. Uh, what clearly was missing was any sort of action. There might be <coughs> a, a gratuitous acknowledgement that there'd be a response to like a left button and a right button and that was it. <coughs> when I was a graduate student, um, it became clear to me that the system, the brain, could not clearly could not be restricted to just the intake of information, uh, no matter how important that might be. And my ideas came together in a paper that a number of you have been kind enough to acknowledge here. It was an American psychologist a piece, a historical piece called The Cinderella of Psychology. And in the paper, I mused about why, ironically, <clears throat> the science of mental life and behavior had paid so little attention to the means by which we get from mental life to behavior, what one could call motor control. And I offered a variety of reasons for that, including things like the methods seem too difficult and some others, um, and you're welcome to look at the paper, of course. I'll share with you that um, actually very recently, <clears throat> um, I had the following chilling thought um, that actually concerns why perception uh, has gotten so much more play and why the functional analysis, that to first approximation has been echoed here as well, frankly, uh, has predominated. <clears throat> and the rather chilling idea is that it's because Plato was a slave hunter <clears throat> and the ancient Greek philosophers who kind of set the tradition for epistemology uh, were slave owners. Um, <clears throat> and so they were privileged men who could sit and contemplate how they know what trees really are and such things. Meanwhile, they had people doing physical work for them who didn't have time to muse about such things. Um, and I'm thinking about working on a paper with a philosopher a colleague called something like, what would epistemology be like if it had not been started by slave owners? Um, so it's a, a new thought I have. Um, <clears throat> I come from a very privileged background myself, uh, though I'm a first generation American. <clears throat> this is me when I was nine years old, uh, playing the violin pretty cute back then, uh, that, that ended a long time ago. But I show the uh, violin because it was a very formative thing in my life um, because it showed me that skill or the lack thereof is really interesting and worth looking into.
to. Um, if you were to find my body uh, dead on the side of a highway, <clears throat> and you could tell that this guy was a violinist still, because I have a violin icky here, and I play chamber music with friends every weekend, and where we play, all the rats and mice have fled. So if you have a problem with, um, with pests, we'll, we'll come over and play for you. We're really bad when we don't. <laughs> Uh, I mention it because um, that interest I have in music kind of melded with my interest in psychology. And it's one of the things that predisposed me to look into this whole topic. Uh, <clears throat> the first major section here is called The Past Meets the Future. <clears throat> and one of the things I'll be doing throughout this talk is to share with you real life observations I made, which kind of opened my eyes to various <coughs> phenomena. So apropos of the discussion of methods, one method that's not talked about very much in psychology is naturalistic observation. <coughs> and it turns out that that, for me at least, has been very, very important. So all of the phenomena I'll be telling you about today come actually just from naturalistic observation. And the first one, appropriately enough, concerns violin playing, <clears throat> amateur violin playing. Um, I don't know if you all know that this means down bow and that means up bow. But um, one time I was in a community orchestra and we violinists were happily, I brought my virtual violin, we were playing down, up, up, 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 down, quickly, easily, no problem. The orchestra conductor, for whatever reason, said, I'd like you to try playing it as it comes, which in violin and string playing speak, that means alternating between down and up bows. Are there any other string players here? <coughs> what do you think? I was violin. Oh, okay. <coughs> so <coughs> he asked us to play this at the same rapid tempo, and we completely fell apart. It was impossible. And we laughed, and then he was very stern and insulted us, and actually quit the office a little while later. <laughs> but I went home that evening wondering, why was this so hard compared to the other case? <clears throat> In general, it's not hard to alternate between down and up. So when you're learning to play the violin, twinkle, twinkle, little, you just alternate. And yet this was terribly hard. And as I thought about it, <coughs> excuse me, and discussed it with some colleagues, we thought maybe the reason these bow bloopers exist, so to coin that term, is that in this case, there's a consistent mapping between directions of motion and durations when you, in this case, <coughs> down bow is long, up bow, each of the strokes is short. But in this case, down bow, at first, it's long duration, but then it's short duration. Similarly here, this is at first a short duration, then it becomes a long duration. So the thought was that <clears throat> perhaps the reason this is so very difficult is because what we violinists had to do was to keep changing the mapping between the directions of motion and the durations of those motions. Okay. Now we took this. I took this into the lab, <coughs> and um, in the 1986 uh, J uh, Journal of Memory and Language, which just become that. Uh, <coughs> we we reported a whole bunch of different experiments involving speech finger, button pressing, uh, and, and other things um, <clears throat> to explore this, because we wanted to know if it was just something that uh, characterized amateur violinists. So <clears throat> to test this hypothesis in speech, we asked college students uh, to come in and just recite the first N letters of the alphabet for us over and over again as quickly as they could. And <clears throat> what we varied was the number of letters they had to go, like N equals two, if it's just A and B over and over again, or 
N equals three is the first three letters cycling through. The thing that was a little unusual <coughs> is that there was a stipulation that people should always strictly alternate between accents and unaccented uh, syllables. So <clears throat> I'll take a deep breath and do this task for you. I'll try to face this way so I don't spit him. Uh, <laughs> so <coughs> the, uh, pe people would speak near our cassette tape recorder <coughs> back then. And in this case, they would say, Amy, 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 like that. Go as fast as you can, just say it. That was the task. People ran away from, from us in the hallway as much as the rats and mice do when my group plays string quartets. Um, and <clears throat> when they had to say the first three letters of the alphabet, it turns out that was the hardest task of all. And though I've done this many times, it's still really hard for me. Um, well, maybe I'll ham it up just a bit for you, but <clears throat> it's to say, a, B, C, A, B, C, A. It's very hard. It's very, very hard to do it properly. And <clears throat> the number of letters that can be recited as a function of list that we've got even guys up there, that's really easy. By hypothesis, consist in mapping between stress and syllable. And down here, it's the opposite. Now, <clears throat> why is this interesting and important? It is, and it applies in so many different tasks that we've looked into that we think it's a general phenomenon. <clears throat> this idea that uh, parameter remapping takes time. So here comes a grand leap that's way, way, way beyond the phenomenon. <clears throat> the idea is that by hypothesis, the way we plan our behavior is conservatively. And if possible, what we do is to minimize the changes that we need to make in successive production. The idea is that <clears throat> if that's what we do, then it might be the case that it is taxing to have to change associations, to change feature mappings. And that might be true because we hold on to these things in working memory. So the idea is that we have a represent, memory representation with features of the things we're going to do. And <clears throat> what we'd like to do to um, streamline performance is to make as few changes as possible. That's an efficient way to go. So that's the general. <coughs> so that sets the stage a little bit for other sorts of phenomena I'd like to describe for you. Again, the idea is to um, going beyond that task where we told people what they should do and think we may have uncovered an ability to foretell the kinds of changes that are difficult and avoid those that are really difficult. In everything else I'll be talking about today, these are situations where people can choose what they want to do. We're not telling them. So this is another phenomenon um, I discovered in my everyday life. <clears throat> and yes, that is my toilet at home. Um, <clears throat> there have been several talks here where plungers have been mentioned. And uh, this is the original plunger. The, the picture was taken after the discovery, I should tell you. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you the little story behind this. So that was our toilet, our bathroom. And I don't remember what I ate the night before. But for whatever reason, uh, that guy needed some help in the morning. <clears throat> and so the plunger was put to its normal use. And then after it was used, I, sorry to go into graphic detail, but you'll remember this talk. I rinsed it out in the sink and then set it down on the counter and went off to work and taught my class. Later that evening, I came back from my day at and state where I was working at the time. <clears throat> and there standing on this bathroom counter is this toilet plunger, which of course I had forgotten about. <clears throat> anyway, very innocently, I took hold of it to put it down where, where it normally belongs, down on the floor, and was 
struck by how high up I grabbed it. I grabbed it really high. <clears throat> and when I did that, while the plunger was in mid-flight, I experienced a brief moment of scientific ecstasy. Um, <clears throat> um, so I love science, and I do it for the love. But I noticed that I grabbed it really high. And I said to, said to myself, almost out loud, David, why did you grab it there? And I tried a bunch of little experiments, and <clears throat> uh, I thought I grabbed it high because I knew I was going to put it down low. And if I grabbed it high, then I wouldn't have to bend down so far all the way at the end. So we brought this into the laboratory, and <clears throat> this is a, Laurel, this is a non-random person. Yeah. Uh, so this was a graduate student of mine at the time, whose picture you saw earlier from Laurel. This is Steve Jacks, who um, served as a pilot subject, is the only person who I felt comfortable asking whether I could show uh, his picture, uh, so his data or not in, in any of the papers. Um, and he actually did this task totally naively, like everybody else. Um, there was a camera to the side, which everybody knew was there. <clears throat> there was a toilet plunger on a little shelf. This is a fixed height. Subject is asked to please keep your hand down by your side and <clears throat> reach out and just move the toilet plunger to that shelf. So just reach out, grab it, and put it on the shelf, put your hand by your side. Then we would move it back and pull out a different shelf at a different height. And we we're interested in where people grab the plunger. So I'll show you a series of images. In the, what we're interested in is the height at which the person grabs the plunger at the exact, when plunges at the exact same height, depending on where it's gonna go. It turns out that these images are completely representative of what our real subjects uh, did. So here's one case. <clears throat> and you can see <clears throat> the lower the target shelf, the higher the grass. And it's a, it's a really big effect. Everyone shows it. <clears throat> People come in off the street <clears throat> out of all days at the university and they just show this. Uh, Rajal Cohen, who I learned yesterday just got tenure at University of Idaho, um, <clears throat> was the lead author on this. And <clears throat> that's the result we got. These are standard upper bars. And there's an inverse uh, relation, linear at the range, we looked at between grasp height, the home position, and the height of the target left. The interpretation is that either based on some kind of online simulation afresh or based on recall, we know not which. People <clears throat> knew at some level that it didn't make a whole lot of sense to always grab it at the same place, though it might have been very comfortable to do so, because that would lead them to get into very awkward positions at the end, up high, down lower, up high. So there's some kind of quick and interesting computation or recall. <clears throat> That's called the grasp height effect. That's now been replicated in a number of laboratories. Uh, last year, something came out on children. And they show the effect, and it gets stronger the longer they go. Another everyday phenomenon, one of my messages here is keep your eyes open to everyday stuff. <clears throat> and again, apologies for those who heard this times. Um, <clears throat> so one day, I was. Um, having lunch with my wife, Judy Kroll. We'll be celebrating our 44th wedding anniversary soon. And she puts up with me, even though I come up with these weird observations like the following. We were sitting at a restaurant, <coughs> innocently having our lunch. Off to the side, put her at a table like this. There was a waiter who, I guess his job was to uh, flip glasses one at a time and pour water into them. So all, all these upside down, I don't know if that's water. Anyway, imagine an ups, a, does, is, here's, here's one. Oh, there are two, can I have these two? 
<coughs> so what the waiter did <coughs> was this. And he did that for a whole bunch of them. And he could do it long enough that I had time to have my eyeballs leave their sockets and say to Judy, Judy, we're so excited. And she said, now what? I said, look, 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 look. And, and she, see, I just did it again. She got it immediately because, of course, you don't normally grab a glass like that. And you guys have heard about this quite a few times here today. Um, <clears throat> so there's some kind of anticipation. Here's a staged uh, set of pictures. These appeared in our American Scientist paper in 2014 called What's in the Grasp. This is a student at Penn State uh, just modeling this for us. So she's going to flip this glass and grab it in the canonical way, thumb up. If she's then going to turn it, 180 degrees, she's going to be in a weird position and she's feigned great unhappiness. But <laughs> were she to grab the glass this way, thumb down, then she ends in a way that better affords control and comfort when you're going to drink or pull whatever. So, <clears throat> so we started with these naturalistic observations and then take it into the laboratory. And this is one of many, many experiments. In, in this case, uh, we invited subjects uh, to <clears throat> stand in front of a handle that they would turn 180 degrees. And <clears throat> so this, when you turn this handle, it moves that disc, which has a little cardboard tab. In this case, the cardboard tab is hiding the number five. And the instruction in that trial would be one. So please reach out and uh, grab the grab the handle and don't twiddle it. Use one hand. We instructed which hand to use in the table experiment. And the question, the variable is a binary one. Do people grab thumb down or thumb towards the tab, actually, uh, or away from the tab? And <clears throat> if you're going to go up that way, chances are you would grab this way and then turn. It's unlikely that you'd grab this way and then turn. And I should tell you, it's a very low friction wheel that we had. So you really had to do some precise aiming. In other experiments, that has been varied. And these effects change in ways that suggest people are really uh, not just focused on end state per se, contrary to the name of the phenomenon. Um, but actually trying to optimize uh, position stability and, and uh, minimize variability, as we showed in the recent paper, uh, when they need to do that the most, when the most time will be spent. <clears throat> the effects are mirror symmetric with respect to an anatomical frame of reference. So it's not a spatial. Basically what people want to do is they want to avoid like hell into that position. That's terrible. And people know that and don't go there similarly on this side. Um, <clears throat> there's a bit of a cottage industry around this little observation. Um, this was a site bulletin paper in 2012, and I felt very honored to see that DF has been tested on something like this. And a lot of you have been getting this simple little uh, <coughs> um, to learn about planning and it's vicissitudes. I'll share with you, and this in a way echoes the emphasis on phylogeny that Paul broached earlier, uh, that I've been privileged to be involved in some uh, uh, animal work as well. Um, <clears throat> so it's known that these sorts of the species can do it, and actually some work has shown that old world monkeys can do it. Uh, in a study led by Dan Weiss, um, because he had a colony of, of um, cotton top tamarind monkeys, he had them with their linguistic prowess or speech perception like prowess. There's Dan. Uh, <clears throat> we wondered, gee, would these animals show the end state? These are not tool users in the wild. 
and ecological observations have suggested that they pretty rarely get into strange postures like this. Really unusual. Uh, nevertheless, to run, um, as reported in a science paper in 2007, um, cotton top tamarins with very, very little training will show the unsafe comfort effect. So what that <coughs> monkey just did was um, she, there she did it again, grabbed the stem thumb down to pull out this uh, sham plastic champagne uh, cup to pull out a little mushroom and or, uh, marshmallow, I'm sorry, uh, inside of it. And um, <clears throat> Dan and the rest of us tried very hard to map, um, rule out all sorts of counter hypotheses. Um, <clears throat> and then um, another Chapman, besides Craig, uh, Katie Chapman, who uh, I had the privilege of working with, wondered whether even a prosimian lemurs might also show this end state comfort. And indeed they do. This was reported in the 2010 paper where uh, lemurs, when presented with an upside down champagne glass, again with a long stem attached, in this case with raisin inside, they don't like mushroom, but mushroom. <laughs> but the marshmallows as much as raisins. Um, it's really quite amazing. They, they seem to understand transparency and will just come charging out and grab the thing and pull out the, the raisin. So <clears throat> this uh, planning ability uh, seems to go back at least 65 million years if you buy the normal argument um, that, for example, Paul um, articulated. Um, now, <clears throat> given how ancient this planning ability is, um, it came as a bit of a surprise that the following happened. And um, I think this is, we don't have sound, um, and uh, there's no sound connection, um, as far as I know. And you might not understand it anyway because it's in German. Um, <laughs> some of you would understand. So this is a little three-year-old girl, and <clears throat> um, her, the game she's being asked to do is just to reach out and put the white end or the black end down into a hole. And she always gets the job done, so that's not really in question. Um, but there, unlike uh, adults, um, <clears throat> she grabs it overhand and ends up thumb down. She does get it in, so it's not that she's failing on the task. And I don't think she's very unhappy in any way. She does get the job done. It's not clear at all that um, she's experiencing discomfort or feels bad about how things are going. Um, <clears throat> but there is this remarkable developmental change that occurs in the likelihood that children show what we so call the end state comfort effect when reaching out for a horizontal dowel. And of course, this has been done with college students and folks like you would grab this way to end that way, or you'd grab this way to end that way. Because you don't want to end this way. Um, <clears throat> children, don't actually reach the same statistical level as adults until around age nine or so on average. And this has been replicated now many, many times. There's a whole re two review articles on this uh, phenomenon. And um, <clears throat> so what's it all about actually? So uh, Dan principally came up with the notion that um, children have rubber limbs, so to speak. Uh, whereas even older, once you get to puberty, you're, it turns out that your range of motion for your arm about pronation, supination changes just a little bit. There's a little tiny spur in your spine that develops around the time of puberty. It's not very well known. Um, <clears throat> so that's why nine might be relevant here. 
Um, and the idea is that in these animals, uh, they don't show the end state complement. But uh, in these in these animals, they do. In animals and us, when it is more awkward to get into certain postures, then we will try to avoid them. But if it's not awkward, you don't. So in fact, while I was thinking about all this, I saw a kid at a restaurant, and all of us who had kids may have noticed this, like the kid would like take a fork and grab something and like do the, yes? I'm at least one person, and you think like, what's going on there? Uh, you know it's going to be open, but you love them anyway. Why kids? Yeah. <laughs> um, now I show you this this thing as a setup for uh, another study. This is uh, was in uh, Mel's journal, Experimental Brain Research, um, by Zhang and me, in which we asked people to reach out and plunk their hand down on an inverted saucepan and slide it on a table to have the, basically the handle go between these different uh, discs, bumps, these different numbers. And what we looked at was what angle did they use as they plunked their hand down uh, on, on the pot. And uh, <clears throat> what happens is that even though the, the pot is an exact same position, same orientation in all these cases I'm showing you, people do not just plunk their hand down in an invariant fashion. Rather, they rotate, or they change the adduction, abduction, adduction, so as to reduce the, the, the extremity of the adduction, abduction angle at, at the end of the movement. Now, as far as I know, <clears throat> um, little kids and adults do not differ in their range of motion for adduction, which is this, and abduction. Um, and that may help us understand a result that was just published by uh, Oliver Herbert and others um, in a child study, um, where they showed that um, contrary to what had been shown earlier for pronation and supination, when it came to the control of adduction, abduction, Children show end state comfort just beautifully. And this was a task in which uh, the children were asked to just put their hand down on a knob to turn a little cr a crane that would lift a, a toy object. So what I think is going on here is that there's not a failure of cognition. One of the troubling thoughts, I'll go back, in this graph <clears throat> is that these children cannot think ahead enough to be able to modulate their hand postures. And that's preposterous, because kids at this age have a theory of mind, they're skilled liars, they can generate complex sentences with, with nested phrases and, and all the rest. So I don't believe that at all. Um, <clears throat> and so putting these results together, I think we have an interesting new example to add to Esther Thielen's dramatic and wonderful demonstration, which hopefully some of you know about, um, indicating that uh, the, the absence of the stepping reflex in babies between about two months of age and uh, 12 months of age or so is not due to cognitive difficulties, as Phil Zalazo suggested, but rather just has to do with their physical ability. They know what their bodies can do, and Esther died much too young. Showed this just so beautifully in, among other ways, uh, holding the baby in a, in a swimming pool in water, and in that buoyant medium, they can step just. So this, I think, is another uh, case in point, uh, our, our NSA comfort work, where knowledge of, or the exploitation, I should say, of what one can do physically is integral to one's action choices. That said, <clears throat> there's other work that has come along, all on the heels of this little observation of the waiter, uh, indicating that in people who are quite old, so old, old means I think 80 years of age or older, um, <clears throat> so I'm not quite there yet, um, 
these people start to show a diminution of the end state conflict. And <clears throat> of course, in them, they have difficulties in movement. So in them, it's likely that there's kind of a double whammy where they have a physical restriction, but they also are having some difficulties. The last major part of the talk uh, is called Apples and Oranges. And it's about the apples and oranges problem. Uh, we heard a little bit about this in regard to shock and money. Um, Sounds like the title of a trashy novel. <laughs> Shock and money. <clears throat> but we've been very interested in this problem, and I'll explain in, in what way. <clears throat> There's a they're fascinating apples and oranges problem in regard to the study of behavioral choice. And we're constantly making choices about totally different things, much as, for example, a bird, I'm not Hopefully it's the same bird, but anyway. Uh, a bird may decide to go forage for food at one instance or sing for partnership uh, at another time. And what, what governs those choices? They're totally different sorts of things, even though ultimately you know, they'll have survival. Now the particular domain where <clears throat> my colleagues and I first looked into this was uh, for two kinds of tests that are not that different, actually. It was a kind of a conservative step along this. And we decided, being motor control people, to look at the coordination of reaching and walking. It turns out that, for example, if you look at my textbook, Human Motor Control, there's a whole huge chapter on reaching, and there's a whole huge chapter on walking, and like the totally different worlds. And yet, <clears throat> uh, when we walk along the aisle in the supermarket, we lively locomote and grab, and it's all one. We're good at it. And moreover, it's not entirely clear what the distinction is. So is this boy not locomoting with his hands? You get it. The, um, <clears throat> the way we chose to study this was, again, to use very simple binary choices in a very simple, hopefully ecological task. Um, so if you were a participant, you might stand here uh, without a slide project projector in the way, and you look at a table, and <clears throat> you would be told something like this. You can pull, you can walk along that side, pick up the bucket with your right hand, and then just put it down on the stool right over here, and then come on back. Or, if you think it would be easier, you can fall, you can walk along this side. I wouldn't say it's reach all the way over. I wouldn't say it. You would use your left hand, pick up the bucket, and carry it to that far. Of course, we don't say any such things. Presumably, fall, uh, you would go this way. Thank you. Well, some of these people give me a hard time. Um, and Paul, would you go this way or would you go that way? Probably go right. Although notice you have less, uh, you have a farther walk to take. Uh, presumably you don't want to lean over very far. And then here's kind of a case and it depends on what your hand preference is. So um, the you can see that the game we're playing is we're varying the horizontal position of this empty child reach bucket. Um, so it's the left, it's the middle of the right, and we're varying the relative distances of the stools. And uh, so this is from the Psych Science paper 2012. And there's a very orderly relation between the probability of going to the left, <coughs> plotted as a function of cooked up uh, functional distance measure. Uh, and it's linear, it's additive, so I really, really believe it. But the idea is that somehow what people are doing is computing a functional or psychological distance for one of the tasks.
chest or the other. And the simple minded idea is that the thing that the walking distance and some coefficient times the reaching distance. And maybe the coefficient would be different, it turned out statistically reliably to be different. These are all right handed people uh, if they're going to use the right hand. The, the bottom line here is that these subjects, I think you guys, would probably be willing to walk something like 11.3 meters to avoid a one meter reach, kind of thing where you're bending over and you might topple over. So <clears throat> there's that kind of trade-off. And um, for those of you who remember <laughs> cigarette advertisements, uh, this is what came to mind. It's a sad commentary on my brain, but um, so if you, but I'm not endorsing cigarette smoking now. I probably should have filled out the form. <laughs> anyway, uh, <clears throat> but this problem is, is well known and it's been talked about for a long time. So this guy says, I, I'd walk a mile for a camel sitting. Now, as we're kind of approaching the end, um, in some other uh, work, <coughs> uh, Lan Yun Gong and Corey Potts, I mentioned to you that, that the electric guitar playing Corey Potts, uh, <coughs> we, they were graduate students of mine at the time, we thought it would be interesting to examine reaching and walking choices in slightly different Contact. And um, so I'll tell you about the experiment, telling you what we expected, and then telling you about God's amazing, strange sense of humor. Um, because we got exactly, totally the opposite, and it's been fascinating to understand why this is. So here's the situation that, that's you, little gray person, that's viewed by chief comedian, um, and you're looking ahead of you, uh, 16 feet away is a stool on the left side and a stool on the right side. And um, at four, eight, well, I'm getting a little mixed up, maybe, um, anyway, different distances, I just, can, I just got, I just had a little mind I don't know. At near at these different distances, there would be one stool. So these are showing all possible places. And on the stool is a bucket. We have two buckets, so I splurge. That's a handle sticking up and it's oriented parallel to the alley. So they're all possible pairs of positions and <clears throat> we say to our participant, we'd like you to just walk down the alley and just walk along and don't stop, just walk along. Pick up either the bucket on the left or the bucket on the right, carry it to the end and put it down. So do whatever you think is needed. And we had a lot of reasons to expect that of course what people would do, of course, would be take the bucket that was closer to the end, not the one that was closer to where they start. Because when it's closer to the end, you don't have to carry it. And we're going to play games with varying the relative weights and looking at all the trade offs and have it appear in dusty journals. There's no one. We expected this kind of relationship. So, probably picking up the bucket on the right would be um, would, uh, would be very high when the right bucket was far from the start point. Far from the start point. That is the point of start. Well, I already Adam graded the outcome for you. And what we found is the opposite. This was true in six experiments plus in three other experiments where we varied all kinds of things. This was in a psych science paper. We used a wheelchair and see what it had to do with the coordination of stepping and walking. <coughs> Lots of different people had different weight. All sorts of different things. And <clears throat> what we got is the opposite. People would, would pick up the bucket that was closer to them, even though, and this I'll use a very technical term, the 
this is very technical term from motor control. Even though they had to schlep it uh, <laughs> further uh, to, to, the, to the end. And so why? Why is this? And we hypothesized in our psych science paper that people were willing to hasten task completion even at the expense of expending extra physical effort that it is onerous to have to remember to do something. It has a heavy cognitive load. And people are willing to expend physical effort to get rid of that load. And because there's no word in the English language for this, we invented a term. We called it sort of the opposite of procrastination. We called it procrastination. Um, <clears throat> Site science accepted it. And then much to my embarrassment, they called all sorts of journalists, and um, it was a <laughs> period in time when we were doing all kinds of interviews. So the Guardian, about three kind of Harvard Business Review, uh, New York Times had a full column uh, one day about procrastination. The reason it seemed to ring true, of course, was not because of silly experiment of picking up buckets. The last thing I ever expected was to find myself as a putative ex